um, they will also need to uh, give you permission to share your screen for us. So. Okay, so let's see. Oh, I got permission. So mm -hmm. let's do, if it's gonna click at some point. Here we go. All right. It was giving me trouble last time. So I was like, I hope it, I hope it doesn't this time. So, all right. So hello everybody and um, welcome to our presentation. Um, we are going to be talking about um, the mentally in incarcerated population and their specifically their transition into society. And my name is Jordan and in the next couple of slides, um, Dr. Crowley will also introduce herself with all of her amazing accolades. Um, and I actually, this is my first time presenting with Dr. Crowley and I'm super excited and um, I'm, I'm honored actually to be able to be presenting with you. So thank you for giving me, me this opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah, no worries. Um, it's interesting because I just left um, a workshop on mentorship and um, <clears throat> some of the individuals that were on the panel um, are some of my mentees and I was just kind of there as a participant and they called me out and one of them was Justina who was like, yeah, Dr. Crowley, she loves to present, go present with her. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, so yeah. Justina's here. <laughs> there we go. All right. So, um, so welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Amy Crowley. Um, I am a counselor educator and a full-time faculty member here at the Chicago School and our CMHC online program. Um, I do have um, quite a few initials behind my name. It's always a joke um, about the alphabet um, that I carry. However, many of those initials are um, vitally important to the work that I do. Um, my areas of specialty include supervision, um, addiction counseling and the LGBTQ population. But as with many clinicians, um, you know, we work closely with individuals um, from other groups, other identified um, minority statuses, other life situations. Um, and there's a lot of crossover as well. So um, in the case of the addiction work that I've done um, for uh, more years than I'm gonna admit, um, I have had the opportunity to um, work with individuals that have been incarcerated um, and those that have been working to transition back into society. And it's a very challenging time um, for those that are both incarcerated and as they're trying to return home and find services. Um, and in fact, this is one area of um, research and um, services that is really lacking in our field. Um, you know, there's a lot of need with this population, but much like um, how society views them when they're incarcerated, that opinion doesn't change when they come out. So, um, you know, a lot of my work, even as an addiction counselor, has been working with individuals um, from incarcerated situations. Um, I also, um, here at the Chicago School, teach a few courses um, and supervise almost always our internship two section. Um, I am very involved in professional associations. Um, I was the founding president of the Algebraic chapter here in Florida. Um, I've also been highly involved in diversity panels. Um, I am the uh, faculty advisor for our department's chapter of Chi Sigma Iota, and I am the faculty advisor for um, the online campuses Pride Plus group. So I do keep myself very active, um, but also very involved in the field. And I'm so glad to be working with Jordan today. Um, it's been fun developing this presentation with her um, and just kind of seeing her um, open herself up to the opportunity to learn and grow and um, really even accept feedback. Um, though she's done remarkably well, um, you know, she's very open to feedback and to see how she can make changes. So whenever you're ready, you can go ahead to the next slide. So my name is Jordan and um, I am a graduate student here in uh, the Chicago School of Professional Psychology and this is only my fourth or fifth term so far and uh, so I'm relatively new but with all of the things that I've um, decided to put on my plate thus far I feel like I'm you know a veteran and I've been doing this for a while. Um, so uh, this is my first virtual conference I presented in my first um, professional conference in Clearwater, Florida for the association in creativity and counseling. And um, that was my first ever, you know, going to present. And um, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into, but it was a good stepping stone, I think, to where I'm at now and um, where I will eventually be. But um, so I have a bachelor's degree in psychology with a minor in um, American Sign Language from the University of North Florida. And um, so 
I'm really excited to be like, this is my first um, time even submitting a proposal, getting it accepted. Um, Dr. Crowley was really good about um, pushing my limits and finding um, where my strengths and my weaknesses are in terms of um, putting together a presentation because I have never done that before. So she was really good at, um, you know, giving me the feedback I needed, you know, for future presentations. And so um, I'm really hoping that you guys enjoy this because it was, it, I put a lot of time and hard work into it. So I'm, I'm really excited for um, what, what the feedback that you guys um, give and um, the types of, um, thoughts that you have on it. So I'm really excited. So thank you so much for being here. All right, so learning objectives. So these are the types of things um, that we want you to be able to um, identify and take away. And there's going to be a couple of um, like poll questions um, I put in here and there to see if you were listening and um, no, just kidding. Um, so you will be able to identify the biases that exist um, in society towards providing psychotropic medication to these individuals. Um, you'll be able to identify the barriers that mental health professionals um, come across when attempting to try and treat these particular um, individuals and integrating them back into society. Um, and then you'll be able to identify the steps that they can take towards advocating for individuals that are transitioning into society and to actually receiving that necessary care that we all know that they need once they are released. Um, and then you will be able to understand the implications um, medication availability has for these particular individuals outside of the correctional facility. And so um, this particular presentation, um, we're going to be talking a lot about um, the different how medications and their and the care that they receive or that they need to receive um, affects the ebb and the flow of how, um, you know, the circle of, you know, going back into prison, being released, and how um, the particular care that they need is crucial to helping the recidivism rate and to help these particular individuals themselves. So, um, so a little background knowledge. Um, the availability of psychotropic medications to inmates is something that I found to be um, quite, it, definitely quite political in itself, but um, it's an issue that um, I was reading about. And so the, when these oh, particular individuals mm -hmm. do not receive the correct medication, let alone any at all, um, that I transition into society will be twice as hard. And so these medications that they need in order to help their particular mental health issue. Um, it's imperative to their ongoing stability and also symptom management as well. And so um, another issue that I found as I was doing my research is that um, the lack of effectiveness that um, in the transfer of their particular um, mental health information. And so um, what I was reading is that once they're in custody of either the court system or the, um, the prison system, their mental health information or their medical information in general may not be received in its entirety or um, it may not be you know, fully disclosed. And so um, the issue with that is um, when these individuals come in, they may not be receiving the medication that they should in that particular prison or they're not receiving any at all. And so if you take a particular um, individual who has a mental health issue and they're not receiving that particular medication, we can only put two, to two, two and two together to figure out that that could be um, you know, not a good thing for that particular individual. And so um, we want you to you know, have you know, in, in the back of your mind that these particular individuals with a mental health disorder, um, these medications for them are crucial both in the prison system and then obviously as they transition out. So um, as mentioned earlier, the access to these medications within the prison facility that they're in is tough. I mean, it's not necessarily as um, you know, open as we would, would think, but there's even more of a limited access um, to these particular medications after they're released. So if we think about it, um, uh, these, the issue of maybe not being able to fill the particular prescription that they get from the prison psychologist because um, a lot of outside pharmacies don't accept um, prescriptions written by a prison psychologist or a prison doctor. So that is one issue that we have to take into consideration is um, 
the, even though they have the prescription and a medical doctor has signed for it, it may not be accepted when they're released because of the, the just the different acceptance rates. And I thought that was absolutely crazy when I read that. I thought all doctors were had that, you know, had that one um, opportunity to be able to prescribe these medications, but I've had, I was wrong. So, um, so obviously the major pressures that these individuals are faced with is astronomical. And so um, what I was reading on is that um, one of the pressures that they go, that they go under is meeting all the parole requirements, obviously when they're released. And then also having that pressure of making a connection with um, a psychologist or a counselor outside. Like not only do you have to, you know, stay within the boundary of your parole requirement, but then you also need to go and see someone to, um, to get those crucial medications that you need. And so um, that was a huge barrier that I found. And then obviously um, the major pressure of finding a job again. I mean, obviously, you know, having a criminal background does not help anyone. But if you think about it, all of the skills that they had learned previously, all of those skills have now eroded because of the fact that they were in prison. So their ties to, to you know, past employers are severed due to the fact that they now have a criminal background. And then employers not necessarily having trust in them because of their criminal background. So that's something that they now have to, you know, it's sort of like, you know, wiping the dry erase board and starting from scratch again. Um, and then I read that um, employers tend to avoid workers due to an assumption that they'll steal or they'll break something or they'll put everyone in harm's way. Um, and it's really sad that these individuals coming from these settings aren't given that opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, to redeem themselves. Um, all right, see if you were listening. All right, so. I need to move this chat box over here. Okay, so what issues do people think of when medication is provided to the incarcerated population with a mental illness? So, you know, someone, you know, not having any sort of information about, you know, giving medication to um, prison inmates, we really wanna hear um, whether someone wants to, I know the room monitor is gonna monitor the chat box, but um, giving them drugs is only going to extirbate the problem. They will, they'll, they'll, not, they'll not use them once they get out. They won't follow up with a mental health professional, all the above. So that is one of the things that um, we had to think about. And one of the things that I was learning is um, there's definitely a bias when it comes to giving medications um, to inc the incarcerated population and not just like the population as a whole, but the particular population of having um, a mental health illness. Um, and so you guys can definitely answer those, um, answer those questions in the chat box, and then we'll definitely come back to it at the end when we, um, do questions, but I just want to be able to give Dr. Crowley enough time to, uh, um, oh, maybe this is mine. Oh, maybe it's yours. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Um, all right. So <clears throat> we're going to kind of dive a little bit deeper here and, um, sort of like the poll questions ask you guys to to think about a question here. Um, that is, there are more citizens with mental illness in jails and prisons than in hospitals. Now, um, obviously this presentation um, was developed before COVID-19. So um, you just kind of want to make that, um, you know, uh, disclaimer there. So um, we would be interested to hear from you all as, um, you know, you can put some responses in the chat box. Um, so why do you think there might be more citizens with mental illness in jails and prisons than in hospitals? Um, so give that, you know, a little bit of thought. Um, you know, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of court systems um, that are involved when we start talking about incarcerated individuals. Um, and the court systems um, are based upon punitive actions versus um, rehabilitation opportunities. Um, and so as I'm seeing some of the responses come through here, um, you guys are, are right on par. It's, you know, with a lack of resources in the community, a lack of access to resources in the community, um, these individuals are oftentimes incarcerated um, due to behaviors um, that are beyond the 
control of them when they are not appropriately treated, um, medicated, or seen by a health professional. Um, so we do get quite a skewed population within the criminal justice system. Um, and what we know, and what we'll talk about here, is um, that the system, the criminal justice system, specifically um, behind the walls of jails and prisons, um, are not always able to or capable of caring for these individuals. So um, more information that we found in our research was that um, women report higher rates of mental health diagnoses as well as greater severity in their symptomology than men. Um, and this probably does not come as a surprise to many of you. Um, we have often seed, seen skewed rates of um, females in outpatients, um, intensive outpatients, community-based services um, than we have necessarily with men. Um, and the reverse um, is that men um, oftentimes um, overpopulate our prison systems and again, those sections of our prisons that treat or um, remediate, address mental health issues. So while women may be reporting higher rates, that's definitely on the out, um, outside of the walls, whereas men um, highly populate our prisons and are um, the vast majority of those seen um, in the prison setting. And then overall, we just know that psychiatric services um, are absolutely needed in the prison system. So um, there was a study by Jacobs um, and Gio Durano who said that um, there were three big findings. Um, one was that um, there needs to, that professional, ethical, <laughs> and even legal standards um, really are demanding more comprehensive services from um, jails and prisons. And what that means is that um, Prisons need to seek out um, adequate funding for these services. They need to hire um, and employ um, appropriate professionals to um, provide these services. Um, and they need to also be working on continuity of care for individuals who may be released um, from incarcerated environments. And this has to start with the um, administrators of jails and prisons. Um, this is something that certainly we're gonna talk about what um, mental health providers can do. Um, however, when it comes to working behind the walls of the jails and prisons, um, we, we definitely have a hierarchy that has to be addressed. And it does start with our administrators. And then the last finding from that study was that um, the social, cultural, and structural characteristics of an incarcerated environment um, are oftentimes incongruent with the services that um, would be the ideal services to give to our inmates. Um, and so it's important to address the um, environmental culture of the jails and prisons in order for these services to be provided, um, delivered and received in a more positive manner by those behind the walls. Awesome. All right, so we're going to get a little bit deeper into that. And so um, this was a really fun graphic because I thought it did a really simple job of, you know, showing us what the lack of treatment can do to these particular individuals. And so obviously the increase in reconvictions and the lack of treatment go hand in hand. Um, and, you know, these individuals uh, have a really hard time securing treatment. Um, when they are released and when they are put out into the real world again. And so obviously the, the, the issue of, um, you know, coming off of the medications that they're currently on from coming from the jail or prison and then, you know, transitioning out. They, I mean, when I was talking to Dr. Crowley, they usually only have a couple weeks worth. And then once, you know, once that runs out, if they don't have someone to go to, to be able to fill that prescription, that then becomes an issue of, um, the, I mean, we, I'm sure we've all done some research on, you know, withdrawal symptoms, whether it be from a major painkiller or just a regular um, medication from, 
you know, from a, a doctor or a psychiatrist, but these particular individuals have mental health issues. And so when they're being prescribed these medications, those medications are helping them with their, um, their symptom management. And um, when we're taking that away, or not necessarily taking it away, but when they're not able to access it, when they get released, um, you know, that they can cause issues for themselves. And then obviously with the issues with the law again, and um, that how that's how their increase in reconvictions happen. So um, they're the disproportionate effects on individuals with mental disorders um, resulted in part due to lack of adequate treatment options. And so um, and some, when they don't have these treatment options available to them, um, you know, that becomes an issue when you're trying to tr retransition or try to get a job. And, you know, it's, I can see how it would become just a tight, you know, circle of, you know, getting better and then not being able to get better and then, you know, making not smart choices and gets them back into the same position. Um, so I had wrote, written down, written down here that, you know, um, this disproportionate effects on these individuals resulted in part due to lack of adequate treatment options, symptomology interfering with social instrumental functioning. Um, that's a really big one. And then along with behavior related to substance use and abuse, which is often comorbid in these individuals with a severe mental health disorder. Um, and so like Dr. Crowley and I were speaking of when we first started this project, when these individuals don't have access to the medication that um, that is crucial to them being able to function in society, they do turn to self-medication, um, whether that be with alcohol or drugs. And um, if they're not um, placed or they're not uh, released into a certain, uh, a, a nice area, I mean, I say nice in quotations, but a lot of these individuals are released into poor urban areas. And so they don't have, um, they just don't have the option of, you know, staying away from the um, the up here, the peers that are negatively affecting them. So that's an issue that um, we talked about as well. Um, uh, so in this particular case, we want to make sure, obviously, the fact of the matter is giving these individuals um, that access to their medication to be able to um, decrease the rate at which they are coming into the prison system and um, making sure they're being helped in that way. Oh, another poll. I forget where I put these. Um, so providing mental health and psychiatric help to these individuals once they are released into society, can that help reduce the recidivism rate? So obviously true or false, I don't know. You guys can put that into the chat box. And then um, if you do have any other questions um, at the end, Dr. Crowley and I would um, love to hear from you. Um, I'm not entirely sure, Dr. Crowley, if you have any um, anything else to speak on this or if we, we would like to move on. I think we're ready to move on. Okay. Okay, so lack of support and care after release. So this is a big one and I really liked um, learning more about this. And um, so we've spoken to the fact that um, the care that these individuals receive following their release is definitely not enough. Um, and so there's, there's obviously difficulty in arranging their own care after their release due to in part, which obviously the barriers that we're going to talk about is the lack of knowledge of these particular services and how to specifically how to engage in them. So, um, you know, not well, when you're released, yes, you may have specific call numbers or maybe you don't um just the individual not having i could see how this could be like a really a, a huge setback for this individual because um the fact that they know that the help is out there but they don't necessarily know how to get to it and so um the fact that the help is out there but they don't have that particular um uh education to be able to find it is definitely something that's worrisome as well um so in part to that, the care that, that that is received when they are released does not reflect their need indicated by their, com their complex and com comorbid uh, conditions. So um, if these individuals are going for help 
um, for either borderline personality disorder or um, schizophrenia or PTSD, um, it's reflected that it's not, the help that they are receiving is not what it should be. And so obviously that's a problem as well because if they're coming for help for their particular conditions and they're not getting the correct help, that's also you know a double-edged sword as well. So, and then um, I had written here that if psychiatrists were given more of a priority when working with these individuals in the correctional facility itself, um, those individuals when released would have a better chance of transitioning. Um, it, I mean, it may still be hard and it may still be difficult for them to be able to find specific resources, but if they were educated before their release and they had some sort of knowledge of um, care after they were released, that, that definitely could increase their chances of a better transition and maybe not, uh, not as so much of an increase in coming back um, to where they started. So. All right, so um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about some barriers um, that we've addressed some of these sort of in our um, earlier slides, but I really do want to highlight some of these um, in terms of their importance. So um, first and foremost is that, you know, a lot of times inmates are released um, from jails and prisons without um, an adequate plan. Um, sometimes they're given, you know, a few dollars for a bus ticket. Um, but they don't necessarily have an established plan. They just have established rules. And um, it can be very hard for an incarcerated individual um, who's transitioning back to society to, to be able to create the plan based on the rules. Um, and so when they're left to their own devices, they may not have the necessary resources. Um, and the prison may feel like they've done their part simply by um, assuring that they have a ride home, assuring that they have a home to go to, and then saying, now the best is up to your parole officer. Um, and that is a very scary place for inmates to be. Um, you know, those that do want to be successful and stay out of the system um, really are unequipped to handle all that will be coming their way. Um, one of the big things we know is that um, there are just a lack of community-based programs for all services. It really doesn't matter um, if you're incarcerated or not. Um, there are just a lack of community-based programs. Um, and with this particular population, we definitely have some concerns about um, the number of programs that this uh, population can be uh, admitted to, can receive services from. So um, the structure of the community in which an individual is released to um, can take away from or add to um, the success of an inmate who's transitioning um, based upon the approach that they take to this particular population. So um, in general, individuals who are transitioning out of prison um, will have some requirements for meeting with their parole officer, um, attending some kind of counseling or um, education groups. A lot of it will depend on their charges. Sex offenders may have a sex offender um, group that they have to attend. Um, those with charges related to drugs and alcohol may have drug and alcohol programming that they need to attend. Um, and so they have these parole mandates that they're really trying to balance, um, but not necessarily given the help to get there. Um, I do know that oftentimes parole and probation offices have like a list of providers. So that's a great start. It gives the um, individual a, a place to start but it doesn't necessarily um, help them know which programs um, maybe best meet their needs or which programs um, are financially affordable. Um, you know, a lot of the barriers with this particular population include things like um, transportation. They may have lost their license, so how are they going to get back and forth to services? Finances, um, you know, they're coming out of prison, may or may not have a job. Um, not likely to have health insurance. Um, they've got a lot of financial responsibility to parole itself. Um, so they're trying to balance all of this in a way that will allow them to be successful, um, to not return to prison, um, yet truly feeling like that is something that um, can be difficult for them to achieve when there are such a vast number of um, barriers that they're facing simply by 
um, just leaving um, the institution. Um, and, and most likely, you know, this was like willingly, you know, they know they're leaving, but there's not really a high degree of um, emphasis put on their transition plans. So <clears throat> if we have some services or some programs like halfway houses, um, then they may have a little more luck in being um, tied into those um, successful services that will work with their population. Um, but we also know that when we congregate um, individuals in small environments such as that, um, that we can also see them feed off of one another, um, which can, as, um, as Jordan's uh, graphic showed earlier, can then lead to um, recidivism um, because they're around individuals much like those that they were incarcerated with, with this um, prison mentality that can be very difficult to break um, and certainly not something that uh, disappears the moment they walk through the jail doors um, to the outside world. So, um, you know, intensive community-based programs would be ideal. Um, and there's a few that um, came up in the research, including, um, you know, the parole um, and assisted outpatient treatment. I know I have a supervisee um, in internship too, who works um, at a parole office and provides um, counseling services for free to inmates after they leave. Um, but it is voluntary. So they can choose to receive services where he works um, as an intern, or they can um, seek out the services on their own, which would, they would then be responsible for setting up, scheduling, and paying for. So I was really pleased to see that um, in some you know, pockets of the world, there are programs that are actively seeking to meet this need to some degree. Um, you know, my intern is uh, a counseling student, so there's certainly not psychiatric services being provided. Um, and a lot of what he ends up doing is case management services, um, because a lot of these inmates come to him with so many questions about where to go, what to do, um, finding services. And so um, that becomes their large stressors that he's addressing in his um, sessions with them versus necessarily um, doing actual counseling work that he would like to do. Um, and then there's also um, forensic assertive community treatment um, programs um, that can be uh, based in the forensic um, or incarcerated um, system that can really help to propel and prepare inmates as they are working towards transitioning. Um, and then, you know, depending on the level of a mental health condition of an inmate, um, there can also be some transitional um, programming for mental health related concerns while they are um, setting up uh, a relationship with a psychiatrist for that medication. Um, and oftentimes that needs to be handled within a psychiatric hospital um, so that the individual can be monitored. Um, many of the medications prescribed in prison um, are not necessarily used in community. Um, and so we need to find some alternative medications. And some of them need to be taken off of their prior medication before they're put on new medication. And these are not the individuals that um, would fare well being out in society without the support services of some um, healthcare providers. So, um, and then also there's, you know, this double stigma. Um, I know Jordan touched on it earlier, but when we have an individual um, who is uh, involved in the criminal justice system, um, there's oftentimes some preconceived notions about them. Um, we may have some of our own biases um, society definitely has a way of judging them simply based upon that label as an ex-offender. Um, and now we add on the stigma of a mental health condition. Um, and how does this individual balance those two as well as, um, I'll use the word tolerate, tolerate the way that society receives them and responds to them. You know, if they are not feeling accepted or welcomed, um, then it's going to be harder for them. And in many cases, um, you know, these individuals carry a lot of shame and guilt for their behaviors, um, especially behaviors that ended up resulting in incarceration, um, you know, returning to the community to find out that the family they once had, the support system they once had, 
um, is not available anymore, um, perhaps due to their own behaviors that led to incarceration. Um, and they're also trying to keep it together um, with their mental health conditions, um, you know, not allowing their anxiety to run off the radar, not allowing their depression to, um, you know, pull them back down, um, managing both the elation of being outside, but also the fears that come with now what? Um, and oftentimes these are the individuals who um, feel like they're walking on eggshells. You know, they don't want to make one wrong move and end up back in the prison system, but they also don't know what all the right moves are. So, all right. So um, here we have some information for mental health providers. As I said, we were going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, how is it that individuals who are mental health providers can, um, you know, understand um, what these particular individuals are facing and then what can we do about it. So um, mental health providers, counselors in community settings um, have increasingly seen the number of individuals from the incarcerated population coming in for services. And again, some of it is due to following parole mandates. Um, and in some cases, due to prison overcrowding, um, individuals are being released early with even stricter mandates. Um, given to them by the parole office. So yes, we'll cut a year or two off your sentence, but you then must comply with all of these requirements. Um, and if you don't, then you have to come back and finish off your sentence. So the goal is to reduce um, overpopulation in the prison settings. Um, and now we're sending them out into the community for their services, fingers crossed that they get them. So as a mental health provider, it's really important that you understand um, and sort of do your self check regarding biases with this particular population. You know, our goal is to always build rapport, to have a therapeutic bond, to meet the client where they're at. But if we carry biases about um, either the fact that they're um, prisoners or ex-prisoners or the charges that they've had, then it can be very difficult to do this. Um, you also want to really evaluate yourself and your ability to work with this population. Um, they can definitely come in with some, um, you know, manipulative behaviors. Um, that's what helped them get by when they were in prison. So that's understandable. Um, they may have a lot of views of you as a mental health provider as being just an extension of the criminal justice system. Um, so you're just one more person who's there to tell them what to do and how to do it. Um, versus really trying to build um, the rapport necessary for effective counseling to happen. Um, so you might even see some paranoia about, oh, well, I can't tell you anything because you're going to run back and tell my parole officer sort of mentality um, and really having to understand that it's not necessarily a defense mechanism that um, is so deeply ingrained it can't be addressed, but more so a survival um, because for them in the prison system, you don't want to show weakness, you want to be strong, um, and certainly not have any needs. So why would that change when they come into the office of a mental health counselor? So we definitely want to be aware of some of the difficulties we might have in building that bond with them, um, but also understanding that um, they are, their reactions can so very much be rooted in the survival techniques from being incarcerated. Um, there are a lot of clinicians who are not familiar with this population. Um, they may not understand the system um, enough to know what a client has gone through in terms of um, being in a county jail, being tried and sentenced, being sent to um, a uh, prison for however many years, um, and then the you know transitioning or reentry from the prison system back into community. Um, and so if a mental health provider is unaware of that, it can feel like the prisoner has to do all the education. And so, you know, they have to educate the mental health provider on what this whole process is, um, rather than the mental health provider having a good understanding of that themselves. Um, and, and just kind of as a quick story, I remember um, having an individual brought in to see me having um, just been released from uh, Rikers Island. And he came escorted by two um, 
state parole agents handcuffed and shackled um, as they brought him into my office. Um, and as he sat there, they would not take off the handcuffs and shackles um, and they stood outside the door. Um, I noticed he was blinking rather slowly and I was trying to gauge if he was, um, you know, maybe under the influence of something. I'm not sure how he would have had something having been escorted by these individuals. But what I noticed was it was an intimidation factor because he had swaps because tattooed on his eyelids. And so he was slowly blinking to make sure that I saw um, that along with quite a few other um, tattoos, but he came in prison clothing. So a lot of them were covered um, and I couldn't see them at the time. Um, so it was, it, if you're uncomfortable with the presentation of these individuals physically as well as their behaviors, um, then it's going to be difficult for that individual to want to work with you, to trust you, and for you to build that rapport. So, you know, if this attitude of mistrust continues, um, then the therapeutic space is oftentimes um, viewed as that negative environment tied to parole versus the comforting and helpful space that we would like to think that therapy always is. Um, so, while yes, all of our skills need to come out, all of our skills, just as if this was any other client, um, some therapists may have some difficulty showing empathy and kindness towards this individual, depending on what their charges are. So, you know, if you're working with an individual who, you know, let's say um, was a drunk driver and, um, you know, part of his charges were vehicular homicide from um, you know, having been drunk and causing a car accident, you as a therapist may have some difficulty showing empathy and kindness towards somebody, um, especially if in their survival defense mechanism, um, they're not necessarily showing remorse for their behaviors. So um, what ends up happening is we sort of have this detached relationship where the individual comes in just to have the check mark that they attended counseling, but they're not really disclosing or addressing any of their information, any of their issues in that therapeutic setting. Um, and so while yes, we're meeting the requirements, the benefit of therapy is, is not present. Um, we do have a lot of concerns with this population um, in terms of disclosure. There's a lot of um, fear of if certain information is shared, how, how will it truly be protected? So um, as a counselor, there, of course, are certain situations in which we must disclose information, um, but then there's situations in which we don't have to disclose information. And sort of as a, a side to this is it is really important um, for you as a clinician to understand that many states um, have some differences in what can and should be disclosed, depending on the type of services you're providing. So mental health services versus substance abuse services, there are some disclosure differences. Um, and so you want to be aware of that. So as you are going over informed consent with these individuals, they know um, what you could and could not disclose. So um, <clears throat> in order to build that therapeutic bond, it's really important to have um, a clear understanding of what is shared here stays here versus um, you know, what actually may not stay in the room anymore. Um, and then one kind of final um, barrier to think about is that oftentimes these individuals um, have attempted to receive services in the prison system and may not have, um, or they received services that were substandard or ineffective. Um, oftentimes the prisons that do allow for some services seem to use them more as behavior management um, than necessarily addressing their mental health conditions. So if we can medicate them enough that they behave, then we've accomplished our goal. So um, for mental health providers who um, are really wanting to see a change with this population, um, it's going to be really important for them to um, understand what the cycle is like for the um, inmate who is incarcerated um, and then returning home. Um, what does it look like for them to, um, you know, receive uh, kind of choppy services if they finally got them set up 
outpatient, um, and then they go back into the prison system and they lose them. Um, so really kind of understanding these two environments and how they um, don't always work very well with one another. Um, and that's as an individual cycles back into the prison um, and back out that we've lost the effectiveness of the, some of the services that are being provided. Um, so instead of counseling or, you know, working towards um, <clears throat> improving the um, prison and jail system, um, it, we also want to make sure that we're focusing on what's going to happen next. So a lot of individuals have a lot of strong feelings about what should and shouldn't be provided to an inmate um, while incarcerated. However, once that individual is released, they are a member of society again and should be permitted the exact same rights as anyone else. So we really want to make sure that, um, you know, the mental health professional, you understand the important role you play in not just providing services, but as in part of that transition as an individual is leaving um, and returning to the community. So, um, you know, while yes, quality of care in prison, mental health services across the board um, would be ideal, we may not always have that. So we wanna make sure that um, we're setting them up for success in our community by having services available um, and what that transition um, process will look like for them. So I know um, we're running just a little bit out of time and I want to be able to give people questions at the end, but this is just something that I did some research on and I'm not going to go too in depth, but this was a uh, California safety bill um, that was put into legislation um, and it was um, due to the prison overcrowding. Um, and so California struggled to provide adequate medical and mental health care for these inmates. And so um, this lack of medical and mental health care, um, you know, impose cruel and unusual punishment in violation of the Eighth Amendment that was talked about in this particular um, safety bill. And um, counties are, were pr provided with minimal guidance for how they should facilitate community reentry, um, including for those with mental health problems. And so as we'll see here, um, the AB 109 safety bill, the US District Court ruled in favor um, of the prisoners during this particular lawsuit. And um, what, what was put into place was a particular hub and um, you know that these individuals would report under and so at this particular hub the probationer um, is assigned a probation officer um, they get some background information on this particular safety bill and then they're seen by a department of mental health staff member to determine the level of mental health substance abuse services that are required that will be required and you know they'll be provided with particular referrals um, and so I thought this was a pretty interesting safety bill to read up on when I was doing my research so there are there are uh, you know safety bills out there um, but I just don't think that they're um, at the forefront um, as they should be so all right so ethical considerations so um, Obviously, these individuals have uh, a constitutional right to treatment, just like everybody else. Um, and uh, I, I learned in my research that the federal and state legislatures don't provide funds for mental health professionals within these prisons. And so obviously, like we were talking about before, psychiatric care is needed within this population. And it not only does good for them, but it also does good for the communities as well. And so um, I just put the ACA and the NADAC Code of Ethics here because they both have within their preambles almost the same um, uh, different, um, I don't know what you want to call it, Dr. Crowley, but they have the same, um, uh, how do you want Standard. to say it? Standards. That's I've been losing words today. Um, <laughs> they do have the same standards. So, um, you know, autonom autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence, justice, and fidelity, um, and veracity for the ACA Code of Ethics. And so within the prison systems, not helping more with these transitions after for release, they're not doing their part to adhere to the pr principle of non-maleficence, so avoiding actions that cause harm. So if they were to, you know, help these particular individuals, they could, you know, help um, stop that domino effect of um, when they release their recommitting crimes because they don't necessarily have the help that they need and um, not necessarily adhering to, you know, the beneficence or them working for the good of the individual. Um, so 
all in all, you know, the NADAC lists similar principles, but adds in, you know, the obedience and the gratitude. And so for these particular um, code of ethics, we've noticed that um, by not helping these individuals, they're not adhering to these particular code of ethics. And so that was something that we wanted to touch on as well. And then, oh, I think that's you. Yeah. Sorry. No. <laughs> I know, so, I know we're running out of time. I feel like I was going to have more time, but it's okay. fine. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> um, so just quickly, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, um, but regarding culture, um, when we have groups of inmates who are often returned to their neighborhoods, um, we're finding higher rates of um, released individuals um, in urban areas and that these settings, these community-based settings are beginning to mimic and look a lot like the um, environment of the prison. And we see this through um, graffiti and tattooing, um, the way they dress, the way they talk, um, and certainly um, just how they kind of like move through their day-to-day -day activities. Um, and so it, it is giving us a disproportionate number of individuals in these communities, um, carrying with them the attitudes that they had while they were incarcerated and um, can unintentionally compromise the feelings that um, that community has as a whole in regards to safety, comfort, well-being. Um, and so an, another cultural consideration is that an individual with a record um, is certainly at a disadvantage um, if they have not been able to um, establish a significant um, work experience, history, training, um, or opportunities um, especially if they were incarcerated for a, a lengthy amount of time. So not only are they dealing with all the stressors of reentry, but they also um, are going to have to secure a job. And what kind of job are they going to be able to secure um, that will also be um, financially um, feasible for them to meet all of their needs when some of them may um, have not completed any um, formal education or training programs to prepare them for jobs. And then sort of the last little bit on here was um, <clears throat> Jordan had found some really good statistics um, from the National Association for the Advancement of Colored Persons um, regarding um, uh, incarceration rates. Um, and so what she has, what the study that she found, and I think it was actually a fact sheet um, on their website, uh, is that um, African Americans constituted 2.3 million or 34% of the total 6.8 million incarcerated um, individuals. So that's fairly significant um, when we think about various um, racial identities and that this population equates for a third. Um, it says that uh, African Americans are incarcerated at more than five times the rate of their Caucasian counterparts, um, and that the imprisonment rate for African American women um, is twice that of their Caucasian counterparts. Um, and so, although African Americans and Hispanics make up approximately 32% of the US population, um, together they comprise 56% of all incarcerated people in 2015. So, um, that's just a little bit of. Um, while it definitely reflects on our court system, um, it's just a little bit of consideration that we want you to make regarding this particular population and the challenges they face. So that is it for now. And I know we were crunched for time, so I'm not sure if anyone has any quick questions they wanna uh, put into the chat box for our room monitor to um, delegate. Um, I have a couple of minutes before my next presentation, so I'm, um, willing to answer any questions that you may have or um, if something comes up you can definitely um, shoot us an email or um, find uh, I'm sure all of the room monitors have had our information from all the email correspondence so that's definitely an option as well. And I have asked our um, room monitor to download the chat where all of your questions are oh, um, so that I can um, send them and Jordan and I can kind of review them um, and if we'll if we're able to get you a response um, to your questions since we ran out of time in our presentation. <laughs> all right. Well, we want to thank you all for coming. Um, we hope that you found the information helpful. 
Um, and um, you, if you have any final questions or concerns, um, I believe uh, Dr. Benita Hudson is the contact person to email, um, and her email address um, is located on the virtual conference um, program. So just reach out to her, and um, I will do my best to get in touch with those that had questions we weren't able to get through. Thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate your, your uh, attendance here today. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so Crowley. Much. You're welcome. Thank you, Jordan. Everyone have a great day.